Hi, this is Larry Cole, and this is Torchbearers, and I'm so glad that you've tuned in with me. I appreciate you um, being here. I appreciate your support and your prayers, and if there's anything that we can do for you, uh, just let us know. Uh, I'm really excited about the time that's ahead. Uh, we're already booking some conferences for 2023. Um, there is the, the words getting out about um, the teaching that I've been doing on the seven spirits of God and how this is forming the priesthood for the last days that's going to walk in the fullness of the spirit. So it, it really excites me when I, I've, I've got a teaching that's um, for a now season, but it excites me even more when I really see how uh, what God's revealing to me for this season or for the next season, but what He's showing me is that it will span uh, many seasons, and I believe that the teaching on the seven spirits and the raising up of the priesthood will be uh, continual until the return of Jesus. So I, I really think what the Lord's doing right now in the earth is very strategic, that He is planning, um, and it's interesting too, the Lord is really emphasizing two primary things to me. Number one, that He is raising up a remnant in the body of Christ that is going to walk in the fullness of the Spirit of God with all seven of the attributes of the Holy Spirit and that this is going to coincide with a priesthood that's raised up in the earth. And this has been God's desire for thousands of years that He would have representation on the earth um, with a priesthood underneath the great high priest, Jesus, the Lamb of God, um, the Son of God. So I'm excited to see what the future holds. And it's interesting also because there is also a counterfeit priesthood that the enemy is raising up. Uh, it's connected with the third temple in Jerusalem and what they're doing there, trying to resurrect the uh, Levitical priesthood. Uh, they're not trying, but they are. Um, and I believe that this Levitical priesthood that is being raised up in Jerusalem is actually going to deceive many people in the church. Um, I have a huge heart for Israel. I have a, a big heart for the Jews to see the salvation that God has brought to the Gentiles provoke the Jews to jealousy, that they would um, um, cry out to the Gentiles and ask, um, how can we be saved? Um, we, we see that what's going on with you, the Gentile church, is proof that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is with you. What can we do to be saved? So I long for that day. I weep for that day. Um, a few years ago, the Lord even sent me to Israel uh, just to pray. That's all I went there for, for 12 days, was to pray. I didn't take any tours. I never left the city of Jerusalem uh, other than to fly in and fly out. The Lord just sent me there to pray. And there's a lot of people in the church that uh, love Israel. They know that, that Israel, um, God has not turned his back on them. There's just a delay in their salvation. And as soon as they recognize the Holy Spirit as the Lord, the veil that has been covering their eyes for millennia will be removed and we will see salvation come to the Jews. The problem is, there are many people in the church that are so hungry and desiring to see what God does in the land of Israel and with the Jewish people, to see revival come to Israel. People are so hungry for it that there's the, a big possibility that there's going to be deception come in the church as a result of a false priesthood that is raised up. There is no priesthood, physical priesthood on the earth that God is raising up. It's not going to happen. The only physical priesthood there's ever been on the earth um, that, that God was pleased with was from the tribe of Levi that we read about in the Old Testament that Jesus did away with. And there are a group of people with a lot of money, a lot of backing, a lot of political influence. Um, these people have power. And they are trying to raise up again the Levitical priesthood, and they're doing it. They've done DNA testings. They have found the Levites. They have found the priesthood. They have the red heifers uh, ready for the, for the offering to cleanse the temple. And, and a lot of people are excited to see 
the third temple rebuilt in Jerusalem, but that is where the Antichrist himself will sit. And if we're not careful, our hunger to see God move in Israel and among the Jewish people will cause us to eat things that are not of God, that will cause us to accept things that God is not a part of. So the enemy is working to raise up a priesthood that is, is going to establish the identity of the Jewish people more in their Judaism than in their Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God who has come. So a lot of people are cheering this on even in the church. There, there's even a lot of evangelical, Pentecostal, charismatic ministers on Christian television that are raising money to help the Temple Institute, to help resurrect the Levitical priesthood and they're convincing the church that this is God's will. It is God's will for it to happen, but it is not God's will for his church to be a part of it. It is not of the Lord. It is of man, and it, it will be used greatly by the enemy in the last days. So I see on one hand, God is raising up the true priesthood underneath the great high priest, Jesus Christ, in the earth. But this is a spiritual priesthood. And on the other hand, the enemy is raising up a physical priesthood in Israel. And the two are coming together. And this will result in the ultimate battle between light and darkness. The ultimate battle between Jesus and hell. So God is establishing a priesthood on the earth. I guarantee it. And this priesthood will be the fulfillment of what God desired to do going all the way back to Egypt, Mount Sinai, Moses delivering his people. This is the fulfillment of that. Even the early church did not see the fullness of a spiritual priesthood established that we read about in the book of Hebrews. We will see the former reign and the latter reign. We will see the glory of the former house and the latter house come together, a double portion and all seven spirits resting on the, God of pe uh, on the people of God. So I'm just really excited about this. Um, you can probably hear it in my voice. I just get pumped up. Uh, because I know that God is about to show his glory on the earth, but he can't do it until there is a people that recognize the Holy Spirit is Lord and they humble themselves to that Lordship so that he can impart all seven of his attributes and characteristics to rest upon them so that then they can function and operate in the holy place where Jesus is seated in heavenly places. Friend, don't think just because there's a scripture that says we are seated in heavenly places that you've got a place of authority there. There are Christians that are living in sin, that are not abiding in the Lord, that are not walking with him. And yet they, they will quote these verses to themselves to make themselves feel better. Try walking with the Holy Spirit and you'll find out real quick just how close you are to him, how much you understand the culture of the kingdom and, and what in us uh, is in opposition to him, what in us is in agreement with him, what can work with him and what cannot. Um, so this is that's another story for another day, but I'm excited. There's a people that are hearing his voice, that are answering the call, that are positioning themselves to be chosen to be the leaders of this priesthood on the earth in the last days. So today we are going to talk about how to receive the spirit of wisdom, eight ways to receive the spirit of wisdom. Now, I can go through this list real quick and I can tell you, hey, if you want the spirit of wisdom, here's eight things scripturally based that will help you receive the spirit of wisdom. And this is really important because the definition of the spirit of wisdom is God enabling us to judge rightly in matters of life and conduct. It is God enabling. So the spirit of wisdom, again, it's the spirit of wisdom. It's not just knowledge with experience that we have, which brings a natural wisdom. But the wisdom I'm speaking of is the wisdom from above. It is the wisdom of God and it is pure and it is holy and it, it imparts his peace and his presence. So this is the spirit of wisdom 
that we have to have in these last days to glorify the Lamb. The definition, again, of the spirit of wisdom is God enabling us to judge rightly in matters of life and conduct. It is sound judgment to help us arrive at a goal. So just like I was talking a minute ago, there are people that are so hungry for revival that even if someone steps up who's not living in holiness and righteousness, but the gifts and callings of God that he's given them to do miracles, to do signs, to even bring in the harvest, we will overlook sin in their life just because they are reaping the effects of the gifts and callings that God has on their life. For example, in the last 15, 20 years, we have seen some moves of God and many leadership uh, leaders in the church gather together and, and confirm to the body of Christ. This is a move of God and we back it and we support it. But we were so hungry for God to do something that there was no accountability brought on the leadership of the revival and it ended up bringing um, uh, a stain on the name of Jesus because people ended up walking in sin. They, yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that. Why? Because we were so hungry for revival that we were willing to neglect holiness. We were willing to overlook love for Jesus, loving him first, putting him first. We were willing to neglect the fear of the Lord. If you want to know why some of these revivals have failed, it's because the spirit of the fear of the Lord was not allowed to rest upon the leadership and the people of God. If you want to know how to receive the fear of the Lord, here it is in, in one sentence. Recognize Him as Lord and try to walk in that Lordship that He has over you and you'll realize real quick, I can't do this. And you will also realize that to whom much is given, much is required and you will give an account for what, um, at what level and how much and even if you did at all make the Holy Spirit Lord in your life. So just the view of trying to make him Lord will bring fear upon us. So I can easily just point out eight things that we need to receive this, the spirit of wisdom. But first thing we have to do is tear down some of the hindrances and the blocks to this happening so that then we can receive. So <clears throat> we're just going to empty ourselves out by the word, we're going to let the word of God cut away the things in us that are not of God to make room for the Lord, for the spirit of God, for the spirit of wisdom to come. So I'm in James chapter three, and I, I love the book of James. Uh, James was one of Jesus's inner circle. It was Peter, James and John. They were the ones that were invited uh, up to the Mount of Transfiguration. So James saw things with the Lord that no one else saw other than Peter and John and uh, Moses and Elijah were there. So out of this encounter with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, seeing Jesus transformed turned inside out and the glory of God shining and then he witnessed the crucifixion but then the resurrection and he spent 40 days with Jesus hearing about the message of the kingdom preach the message of the kingdom go and make disciples and then James sits down with the Holy Spirit and writes his letter based on um, all these things that he had experienced so James chapter 3 starting at verse 13 here we are. The title of this section in my, in my Bible, it says wisdom from above. Again, this is not the wisdom of man, but it is the wisdom brought to us from God. So James chapter three, verse 13, James begins with a question. Who among you is wise and understanding? All right. One thing you got to remember in the scripture, whenever it mentions wisdom, it's talking about the spirit of wisdom. Whenever it mentions understanding, it's talking about the spirit of understanding. So another way to reword this question is, who among you has the spirit of wisdom and has the spirit of understanding? Let him show that he has these attributes of the Holy Spirit 
by his good behavior. Good is something that's beneficial for the kingdom, behavior that benefits the kingdom. By his good behavior, his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. So now he even begins to describe what the spirit of wisdom is like. The spirit of wisdom is gentleness. So if you've got this idea that every time the Holy Spirit speaks to you, um, that he's, he's hard disciplining you, that's not the spirit of wisdom. The spirit of wisdom comes in gentleness. Verse 14, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. So here he's talking about who among you has the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Let him show it by his good behavior, his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. And then he says there's a contradiction, an exact opposite to what he just asked. And it is bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart. If we have bitterness, jealousy and selfish ambition in our heart, the Holy Spirit of wisdom will not rest upon us. So James is really good about cutting away the things that are not of God to make room for the things that are. And he specifically calls out bitterness, jealousy and selfish ambition. Verse 15, he says the wisdom, this wisdom is not that which comes down from above. So if, if someone says, I've got wisdom that is from above, and yet they walk in bitterness and in jealousy and in selfish ambition, friend, they're a liar. And they don't have the truth of God, and they definitely don't have the spirit of wisdom. So he says, verse 15 again, This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but this wisdom is earthly. So there is an earthly wisdom. There is knowledge. People go to school. They go to higher education. They learn all these things. And then they learn how to apply their, their knowledge to, to do things. And through experiential knowledge, they do gain wisdom. But again, the wisdom that comes with bitterness, with jealousy of what others are accomplishing, with selfish ambition, I just want to... Um, get promoted. I just want a title. I want to be seen. I want notoriety. I want authority and I'm willing to step on people to do it. I'm willing to go um, in major debt just to do it. That is not the wisdom from above. That is wisdom that is earthly, that is natural. Anything that is earthly and natural is fading away. It is temporal. It is only the things that are eternal, that are of God. And then he describes it even more. It is demonic, he says. This selfish ambition that you have, that you call wisdom, it is demonic. Verse 16, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder. So the spirit of wisdom brings order to the church. Galatians 5.25 if you're going to live by the Spirit, then walk in the Spirit. That word walk in the Spirit means stay in your ranks. Stay where the Holy Spirit has put you. Do not promote yourself. Let the Lord promote you. Let the Lord move you. Let the Lord give you a title and a place. If you do it on your own, that is selfish ambition. So there is disorder. This, this wisdom that is earthly, carnal, and demonic will make you discontent with where God has put you. It will make you impatient. It will make you step out prematurely with the little bit of revelation that you've got before you've prayed into it, before you have received uh, wisdom from God, counsel from God, understanding from God, how to walk in this revelation. We get impatient and it brings disorder to what God is doing. There is disorder and every evil thing verse 16 so this jealousy and this selfish ambition that we call call wisdom but it is not the spirit of wisdom it brings disorder 
and every evil thing. So man, there's a lot of people that are naming the name of Jesus, but they're walking in their own wisdom, in their own desire, selfish ambition. They're jealous of others that are being promoted. And as a result, it is making room for every evil thing. Verse 17, but the wisdom from above is first pure. So James is saying, do you have wisdom? Do you have the spirit of wisdom? Do you have the spirit of understanding? There's a lot of what you're calling wisdom and understanding, but it's selfish ambition. And I've called it out. But then he goes back to describe those who have received the spirit of wisdom. Here's what it looks like. The spirit of wisdom, verse 17, James 3, verse 17. But the spirit of wisdom from above is first pure. Pure means it's one. It's not mixed with my thoughts, my emotions, my ambitions, my desires. It is one. It is of God. I know when the spirit of wisdom comes upon me because it is purely God. It's not my own imagination. And the second attribute is I feel peace. So he says in verse 17, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then it is peaceable. Peaceable doesn't mean to be lacking uh, conflict or um, um, affliction, tribulation, temptation. That's not peace. Peace is just being right with God. So when the spirit of wisdom comes, he first comes with his purity, then he brings peace where I know I am right with God. So it doesn't matter what's going on around me because I have peace. It is gentle. The spirit of wisdom is gentle. He wants to talk with us, fellowship with us and teach us to judge rightly in matters of our life and our conduct so that we can arrive at a goal. He is reasonable. He understands the weaknesses that we have, the places where we have fallen short. He will listen to our reason. He will listen. He's not just going to cast it down, but he will listen. And then he will tell us how to overcome those things. He is full of mercy and good fruits. What are the fruits? The fruits of the spirit. He is un also unwavering. Even though he will listen and he will reason with us and he'll understand, Lord, this is why I, I was disobedient. This is why I was hesitant. This was why I ran out ahead of you and tried to, to do something. He will listen to that. But then it all comes back to this. He is unwavering, which is his mercy because his unwavering is going to show us where the center of his path and his will is. And it is without hypocrisy. So that is one way you can really recognize people that have the spirit of wisdom resting within them. They are pure. They are gentle. They are without hypocrisy. <laughs> Verse 18, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness, righteousness being one with God, is sown in peace by those who make peace, by those who make others right with God. So what is the goal of the spirit of wisdom? To make things right with God. It's the ministry of reconciliation. This is the purpose for the spirit of wisdom. I'm going to go a little bit into James chapter 4. So James is actually going to expound on what he's been saying. He says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? So he's been talking about the spirit of wisdom. And then it seems like he shifts and he asks the question, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? So this kind of reflects back to what he said a moment ago about bitterness, jealousy and selfish ambition. This is resulting in quarrels and conflicts among you. Friend, this is proof that the church is lacking the spirit of wisdom and we are just consumed with jealousies, with bitterness, with our own selfish ambition because the result is that there are fights and arguments and conflicts and quarrels among us. Is not the source of these conflicts, of these quarrels, is not the source of it your pleasures, your own desires that are waging war in your members. You're desiring, verse 2, 
James chapter 4, verse 2, you're desiring and you do not have. So as a result of what you desire, but you don't have it, you commit murder. What is this? It's slander. It's people talking crap about their friends, um, about their leaders, about their pastors, about politicians, because you're jealous, because you've got selfish ambition and you're committing murder with your tongue. You are envious, he says, and you cannot obtain these things that you want, so you fight and quarrel. So the whole purpose of these arguments and these conflicts, even in the church, is selfish ambition and jealousy. People are wanting what they don't have. You do not have, he says, because you do not ask. Did you ever stop <laughs> to think and ask the Lord what he wants? So it's not just... Um, stopping and asking the Lord for what you want, it's asking Him for what He wants. So He says, just ask the Lord and you might receive. Verse 3, you ask, so some of you have moved on to the next level. Hallelujah, you did ask, but you still don't receive. Why? Because you ask with wrong motives. It's all about you, your selfish ambition, your jealousy of others. So that what you are asking for, once you get it, you just want to spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, wham, here we are. It's just like the ten virgins. Man, even the foolish virgins, they were not accused of committing adultery. They just didn't have the double portion of oil. But here's what he says. All of you, people, uh, God's people that are in the church, you've got jealousy of one another. You have this selfish ambition that's driving you to want to be seen, to want to be known. You're committing adultery. Against who? Against Jesus. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Man, people are desiring the things of this world where your heart is, that is where your treasure is. You're desiring the things of this world. You want to be a friend with the things of the world um, so that you can be seen and be known. But this is hostility towards God. So we see where the spirit of wisdom breaks our love for this world. Um, verse 5, Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He, meaning God, jealousy, jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. But he gives a greater grace, verse 6. Therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 7, here's the key. Submit, therefore, to God. For this is the power to resist the devil and make him flee from you. Verse 8, draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Verse 10, if you will humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, he will exalt you. So, man, I love the book of James. Um, so real quick, let's go through eight things needed to receive the spirit of wisdom. James has showed us here's how to get your heart right so that you can receive the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Now, here's eight things to receive the spirit of wisdom. Number one, obedience. We just talked about this, Galatians 5.25. If you're going to live by the Spirit, then you also have to walk in the Spirit. You have to stay in your ranks. Humble yourself. Don't move ahead of the Lord. Walk with Him. Be patient. God is not in a hurry. He's going to get it done. He's going to make it happen. Stay in your ranks. Number one is obedience. Number two, humility. Proverbs 11.2 says, When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But wisdom, the spirit of wisdom, is with the humble. If you want to receive the spirit of wisdom, stay humble. Humble isn't an act. It's not an action. It's not, well, I'm put in a circumstance and now I have to humble myself. Humility is an identity. It has to become us. It's not something we put on and take off. It's something we have to become. Number three, ask. James, 
In chapter 1, verse 5, James 1, 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, the spirit of wisdom, let him ask God for the spirit of wisdom, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given them. So, if you want the spirit of wisdom, just ask the Lord. Uh, number four, you need a revelation of Jesus. Matthew 16, 18 says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You need a revelation of Jesus. So we see that, so how did, what does this have to do with the spirit of wisdom? Well, Peter got the revelation. Jesus was asking, who do people say that I am? Peter got the right answer. And, and Jesus commended Peter and he said, Peter, you didn't get this on your own, but my Father in heaven revealed it to you. And he said, on this revelation, on this revelation that Jesus is the Son of God, I will build my church. Again, what is the definition of the spirit of wisdom? It enables us to judge rightly in matters of life and conduct. It is sound judgment to help us arrive at a goal. What is the goal of Jesus? He said, on this revelation, I will build my church, a church that the gates of hell cannot prevail against. So this is the goal that Jesus is wanting. And how does it come to pass? By a revelation of who he is. And it's not just once when we go to the altar and we get born again, but it is continual revelation of who he is. For as we see him, we will be like him. So we need a revelation of Jesus. Um, number five, how to receive the spirit of wisdom? Worship. Check this out. Psalm 49, verse 3 and 4. The psalmist writes, My mouth will speak wisdom. How do you speak wisdom? You have listened to the spirit of wisdom. Through my heart meditating, I gain understanding, the spirit of understanding. So let me read that again. Psalm 49, verse 3. My mouth will speak what the spirit of wisdom has told me. Through my heart meditating, meditating, I gained the spirit of understanding. Verse 4, I will listen to him. He speaks to me in parables. His deep sayings will be revealed upon the harp. Listen to that. You want to receive the spirit of wisdom. You, you've got to gain an ear to hear what the spirit is saying. And he says, the deep sayings of the spirit of wisdom will be revealed to me upon the harp. When there's music, when there's worship, when I am, am striking a chord, when I'm, when I'm playing um, the music, that glorifies the Lamb and I get lost in worship, that's when His deep words, His sayings, His revelation are revealed to me is when I'm worshiping. So number five, how to receive the spirit of wisdom, have ears to hear what He's saying. How do you get that? Worship Him. Number six, how to receive the spirit of wisdom, the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 15.33 says, the fear of the Lord which is the spirit of the fear of the Lord, brings the instruction of the spirit of wisdom. And it is humility that comes before honor. So the spirit of wisdom comes from the fear of the Lord. So we need the spirit of the fear of the Lord to receive the spirit of wisdom. Number seven, allowing God to do this. Exodus 20, 25 says, If you make me an altar of stone." You shall not build it with stones that have been cut. For if you put your tool on these rocks, you are profaning the rocks that you're building this altar with. So what does this have to do with the spirit of wisdom? Because God is saying, I have everything that you need to make worship of me happen. Happen. So what, what, what's going on when people say that they want to be in ministry? They should be saying, I'm looking for a way to glorify the Lamb, to bring His kingdom to the earth. I'm looking for a way to worship the Lord. So often we see in the scripture that God saw someone worship Him. So and so went and sacrificed unto the Lord. Um, this king brought 
uh, thousands of bulls and rams and sheep and sacrificed unto the Lord and the Lord saw it and the Lord blessed the kingdom. It was worship. So if we're going to truly worship the Lord in the ministry that He's called us to, I don't care what it is, if it's staying at home with your kids or if it's being the CEO of a company, that is your ministry. The people that God has set before you is your ministry. And in order for your ministry to be successful, you've got to have an altar. You've got to have a place where you sacrifice yourself and die daily. And your ministry has to be built. This altar has to be built out of stones that God has made not that you have cut and shaped to make your ministry what you think it's supposed to be. So if you want to receive the spirit of wisdom, you have to allow God to put it together. And then last, number eight, how to receive the spirit of wisdom, seek his instruction. Seek his instruction. Proverbs 10 verse 8 says, the wise of heart. How do I become wise of heart? I love the spirit of wisdom. Love is from the heart. I'm loving the spirit of wisdom. I am getting, I am becoming the wise of heart. He says the wise of heart, those who have loved the spirit of wisdom will receive the commandments. Friend, I, I don't even like that word commandments. And it's not that I'm throwing it out, but to me, it could have been interpreted better by saying something like this, invitation. Like the man that asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus said, love the Lord God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, understanding everything that you've got. What if Jesus would have said, this is the invitation to love the Lord God with all your heart? That's not a commandment. You can't command anybody to love you. So what is it? It's an invitation. And what is the greatest invitation to love him, to receive his love? and love him back. Friend, that's our purpose on this earth. God has passed out an invitation to us by his Holy Spirit to receive his love and to love him back. And then what's my ministry? To go and pass out those invitations to everyone I know. The Lord is saying, if you're going to go to just one event, one party, one gathering this year, come to this one. Here's the invitation. This is the best invitation you could ever receive to receive the, Lord, the love of the Lord, your God, and to love him back. So if you want the spirit of wisdom, receive his instruction. The wise of heart will receive his invitation. Every day, God is inviting us to receive his love and love him back. And then here's the opposite of that. A babbling fool will come to ruin. So the wise of heart, those who love the spirit of wisdom, will receive the invitation to be a part of what the spirit of wisdom is doing and what God is doing. So friends, I love you. Thank you for joining in. I know this went a little bit long. Again, um, contact us. Let us know how we can pray for you. Uh, also, if you'd like to book us for a, a conference or an event, uh, we would love it. Um, we just really want to get out in the body of Christ. We're seeing people healed, people saved, and the power of God impacting the earth. Uh, we love you. Thank you.